Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, please stand for the call to worship. O oh, give thanks to Yahweh and call upon his name. Make known his works among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, speak of all his wonders and glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength, seeking his face continually. Remember his wonders which he has done, his marvels and the judgments uttered by his mouth. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. And so together let us invoke our God. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. And now, to you who are loved by God and called to be saints, the conquerors who overcome the world and darkness and shall inherit the crown of life, grace and peace in the election of the Father by the blood of the Son and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well then, let us profess the name of God, declaring he is the triune God who has redeemed us by the blood of the Son. So let us now declare the summary of our Christian faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Beloved, we have a confident faith because we know God does not lie. He is almighty and yes, we might not lie, but we certainly cannot make to come anything we desire, but God can. And so let us declare that he is the immortal, invisible, only wise God, all powerful and great and our father. So let us sing immortal, invisible. Be seated. Any song that seeks to summarize scripture, any psalm, is going to bring to us a conviction of our foolishness because we are forced to confront, on the one hand, what we are claiming as we sing versus what we are actually doing as we go out from here. And now we have just sung that we believe God alone is wise and He is all wise, but we are going to have to confront the Tenth Commandment which says that we doubt God's wisdom and care for us. Remember, as we see the law, that God has called us to be worshipers of the one true God. And while we are not yet in heaven, 
in Hebrews, we are told that we gather together with the angels of the festival because we've come to the mountain of God. And so the question that we ask here is, are you coming boldly and arrogantly in your own righteousness or are you coming clothed in Christ's righteousness? Do you think you are to decide that you are fit or is it God who will make you worthy? That's the question that we have there. And I hope that we are wise enough to submit to the, the will of God. As it asks now, by whose standard are you going to be measured? Have you believed the lie? You are as wise as God and able to therefore discern and declare what is good and what is evil. How do we answer? No, God is judge. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So now the question to us is, what is it that we're actually hearing? What is God's will for you and me in the Tenth Commandment? that not even the slightest desire or thought contrary to any of the commandments should ever arise in our hearts. Rather, with all our heart, we should always hate sin and delight in all righteousness. So, first four commandments, how to worship God. Then the next five, how we are to interact with men. And the last one says, what is your heart's disposition which only God is able to see and know? And we are to be a people who actually believe God is wise and good. We love him and we trust him. And therefore, we are not envious, bitter, coveting. But rather, we trust that the life we have at this moment is the very one that God wanted us to have. Secondly, because we know God is good, we know his will is good and we delight in it. Our problem is that we have come before God not wanting to know and praise God. But we're coming before God, showing off and saying, please consider all these wonderful things that I've done so that I can be rewarded, so that I don't have to be judged with those bad people out there. This one says, no, if you have not delighted in God and in his care for you, you are one of those bad people out there. And your only hope is if God is merciful. And so let's come before God and at least where we are able to say something of value, say, God, I acknowledge I am not content because I have not trusted you. And this reflects in every part of my life and the 10th commandment exposes that. And I'm horrified, but at the same time, thankful because I know you've given me a knowledge of sin so that I will come and in Christ Jesus, I will obtain all the benefits. So, God is now speaking to you through his word by the Spirit to bring you to conviction of sin. God has sent his Spirit to convict us of our sin and guilt and also to make us call out to him asking, have mercy on me, a sinner. So let's do that. I was a natural man with hands full of the blood of the innocent. God justly calling my service and offerings vain and an abomination. But you wrote my name in the book of life before the foundation of the world. While I was still weak, Jesus, my Redeemer, died for me. The blood of Jesus Christ purifies my conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So I am a new creation, a son of God, by faith in Christ Jesus, and he calls me his friend. For all these benefits to be yours, how are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. That is, although my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all the commandments of God and have never kept any of them and am still prone always to all evil, yet God, without any merit of mine, of mere grace, and imputes to me the perfect satisfaction righteousness and holiness of Christ as if I had never committed nor had any sin and had myself accomplished all the obedience which Christ has fulfilled for me if only I accept such benefit with a believing heart. Beloved, this is not an idle promise. This is the all-wise God who reveals for you or to you his plan of your redemption. 
And so let us come before God and confess our sins and let us obtain all the benefits in Jesus Christ. <coughs> our great God and Father, we have declared with scripture, you are the immortal, invisible, only wise God, perfect in all you do, and yet, in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, we have been embittered against you, believing you to be foolish, incapable of rightly managing your creation, failing to realize how wonderful we are that you did not give us every good thing and how you have foolishly blessed our enemies, people we know and have already judged. And yet we dare to come before you and confess that we want to dwell in your house forever. Lord, we pray that we will understand that it is indeed incredibly foolish for us to be like the guest who came to the banquet dressed in his own robes. Help us to understand that we are indeed the undeserving and the guilty, but you are the gracious and merciful God. Though we had done nothing but sin, yet you, instead of allowing us to go in the way of death, you gave us your spirit and regenerated us and united us to Christ, and you've granted that we should obtain every benefit, every work of righteousness that Christ has done, and all our guilt be transferred to his account, that he should die that horrible sinner's death in our place. We ask, O oh Lord, therefore, that we would not be emboldened in our arrogance, but rather we would be humbled despite ourselves and give all glory to you acknowledging that our only hope and comfort in life and in death is Christ's work and your love. And so we ask, therefore, that we should now mature in the faith, that we would indeed more and more learn to be content in your providence, whether in marriage or in single life, whether rich or poor, healthy or sick. Lord, in whatever time, whatever season of life and whatever condition we possess, that we would say, our God is good, and he will sustain me through this, and he will bring me to everlasting glory far beyond anything the world could know. May I just therefore be patient and trust, and we ask therefore this would be reflected with a content heart. No more envy, no more coveting, but rather contentment and joy in you. And so we pray that your church would reflect this wonderful character of the Spirit worked in us. And for this we are thankful. Amen. Beloved, please stand. Let us then hear the words of pardon that God gives. Beloved, to you who by faith have confessed and repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' merit alone, I declare in the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, your sins are forgiven and the record of your transgressions is blotted away and your everlasting salvation is hid now in Christ Jesus and he will resurrect you in the last day. And so let us respond by singing Psalm 22, wherein we consider the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, forsaken by God, his own Father, and how he did this in order that he would lead the assembly to come and bring glory to his name and to God the Father. So my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is Psalm 22, verses 1 through 10 and verse 25. Oh! 
Please be seated. As we come before the Lord in prayer, understand that we are the people who have been granted the great blessing of life in Christ. And so we are not only expressing our thankfulness to him, but we are also praying that we would be sustained in this grace, that we would not fall away, but also that we would then be instruments used by God to bring this light of the gospel to the nations. In particular, you see that we always pray for Ventura and Reform Faith and Life in Armenia, where God has granted us a special relationship, but also we want to keep in mind the whole world. So we are going through the calendar and praying for the nations of the world, and you see those listed on page 16. Let us now go to our God in prayer. Our great and almighty God, we are so thankful that though we are foolish, that we were born to a world of sinning men and women, yet you have drawn us here this day in order that we would come and once again be ministered by your word and spirit and be refreshed. Also, that we would fulfill our calling of praising and glorifying your name. And we would remember that it is by the blood of Christ that we have been made new and are fit now to dwell before you. And so we ask that we would always have thankful hearts remembering the costly sacrifice, Christ himself being forsaken for our sakes. And now we united to Christ and therefore to you forevermore, that we are able to obtain every blessing. And as a people who have received this great blessing, we pray that we would not be a covetous and foolish people who look upon the things of this world that are perishing, but instead we would know, we would believe and be thankful we already have the greatest treasure the assurance of everlasting life. And now we are free to serve you. Even if the world should kill us, we will lose nothing, but we will dwell in your house forever. And so we pray that we would know and believe more fully, you are a loving father. You have adopted us. We are protected by you. You will preserve us to the end. And so now we come to you and we ask, use us for your glory. Lord, we have to confess, We've been more concerned about the things of this world. We have worked hard and forgotten to take the Lord's Day to be before you. We have studied so much that we neglect to read our scriptures or come and worship you, and yet you remain faithful and drew us here today. And now we come to you and we confess that we have indeed coveted all the things of this world, but we have not rejoiced in you alone. And yet you still loved us so much so that you forced us to set aside the things of this world and come here. So may we be grateful and praise you. We pray, Lord, that we would also never be ashamed or afraid again, but rather knowing what a great treasure we have and knowing the world is perishing, that we would bring the word of life to them, whether in our own family, spouses, children, siblings, parents, but extend it further, going to our neighbors, to our classmates, to the people we work with. Lord, we are given the privilege of declaring the excellencies of your grace, and yet we are so afraid and fearful of our reputations. Lord, forgive us, one, for our failing to do our work, but strengthen us that we should do so with wisdom and with love, so that even a people who have hated you and are hostile to you would still hear, and by your Spirit you would draw them to your church that they would obtain the blessings of the gospel. We pray especially for the works where we are privileged to participate in Ventura and in Armenia. And we ask that these works would bring glory to your name and that you would call people to yourself from out of darkness. But we also ask for the work in Iraq. And Lord, after centuries of preserving for yourself some witness, in the last two decades the church has been decimated and almost no believers are left. Lord, we ask that you would show mercy to the peoples of this land, not because they deserve it, but because you are worthy of being glorified. And so we ask that you would cause even those who persecuted the church to turn and repent and bring glory to your name. We pray for the people of Ireland who have so confused your name and your work with the Roman church that 
every fault of the Roman Church they now blame on you. We ask that you would bring the Irish to repentance and that you would weaken the power of Rome and may the gospel go forth. And Lord, we pray for the people of Ireland to again remember the great faith of their ancestors who sent the missionaries to all the pagan and idolatrous lands of Europe and evangelized that the Irish people again would be a light to the nations. We pray for Israel where so many people who are physical descendants of Abraham hate you and will not worship the true God but instead curse believers and prevent them from evangelizing. And Lord, we also come before you with grief in our hearts, knowing there used to be, we've heard as high as 15% of the Arabs of that land were Christians, but now they've been chased to Europe and South America and the United States, and there's few believers left. We ask that again, by your spirit, you will cause Jews and Arabs to turn to you and that the church would once again proclaim the gospel and that the Jews and the Muslims would hear and many would turn to you and live and that land would, be a, would be a place of light. And we pray for Italy. And Lord, we are thankful that we know and are able to support United Reform missionaries in Milan and in Perugia. And Lord, we are also adding today Romania because we are hopeful of our classes raising more funds for the missions work taking place there. So, Lord, we pray that we would be generous to support these works, always keeping them in prayer and remembering that it is you who is graciously bringing to yourself a rebellious people and forgiving them and adopting them. Let us therefore never be so bold as to believe we are worthy, but instead every day to be thankful as we consider we deserve no better, but yet you loved us. And so may we come before you glorifying your name, thankful for what we have, and remembering the duty we owe your holy name, but also the duty of love we owe to one another. Today, especially, we pray for Ani and her family. And Lord, we ask that you be with them as now they are going to lay to rest their father. And we ask that at this time, that all the peoples would hear the gospel proclaimed and would be comforted by your spirit. Lord, we pray for Betty and for her family as they are seeing sister whose body is decaying. And we ask, Lord, that at this time there would be comfort even in these times of trials. We know also that there are families that have struggles. And while everybody does not want their troubles known, Lord, may we be mindful to come alongside and just encourage one another wherever we are able. And let us also be humble enough to accept encouragement from others rather than arrogantly casting away the help of our sisters and brothers. And now we come to you acknowledging that we are indeed one family because we together with one voice declare the Lord's Prayer and call you our Father as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand now for the reading of the written word of the Lord. <clears throat> Let us hear then the written word from the Old Testament, Psalm 773. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts up through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. Truly, in vain, I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. 
If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary and then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven from but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord Yahweh my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. From the New Testament, we see then the fulfillment of what it means to go to the sanctuary and see the end of sinners as we see the crucifixion of Christ. Matthew 27, 27 through 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and they put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. And they took a reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put on his own clothes and led him away to crucify him. 45 through 48. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, wait, let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Verse 59, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. Romans 3, 19 through 26. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 5.8 But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4.10 In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So far the written word. Humble our hearts that we would submit to your spirit and the revelation of the word, and we would seek to understand the word you've given to man. Lord, may we know how much you hate sin and yet how gracious you are to many sinners. And may we never be arrogant, but rather always grateful for the privilege of having been called and having been given ears to hear and a heart which believes that we should in Christ Jesus have everlasting life. May all glory be given to you. Amen. Please be seated.
Over the last several years, as we have been looking at the book of the Psalms, we have sought to understand the Psalms not just individually, but within their context, because we can definitely see an editor's hand bringing them together. So just simply, when you look at it, it's divided into five books. So already, clearly, some choices have been made. Then there are certain things that are marked out, like from Psalm 120 to 134, they're called the Psalms of Ascents, where every one of them is about ascending the mountain of the Lord. So there's definitely a deliberate choice of putting Psalms together in a certain sequence because it is carrying forward a message that God has for us. What is it that therefore we are to learn? God is, God rules and the righteous will dwell with God and obtain every benefit, but the wicked will be forsaken by God because they walk a forsaken path. However, it's not like you can simply just find the right path and walk righteously because you are opposed by the kings of this world, by the spirit of this age, and even your own nature does not want you to glorify God, but rather you live selfishly. So. While Psalm 1 declares the righteous will obtain all the blessings and warns that the wicked will perish, we discover that the wicked is all of us, the world, our leaders, our rulers, the wise men, the rich. We are all being led into corruption. But God is going to bring about the end he desires. He laughs at the foolishness of man's plans. And ultimately, he establishes a kingdom where many will bow to the Messiah and glorify his name and obtain the blessings. However, very clearly we see it's going to be a difficult path for the righteous because Psalm 3, which kind of begins us now in the narrative, if you will, already shows David having to flee Jerusalem because his son has chased him out. So David does not have his throne, his honor and dignity. He does not have access to the temple where he can worship. And so we discover we are aliens and strangers. And throughout the rest of book one, we have both a high points where we are told man is made second only to God to rule over creation. We are told that man can ascend the mountain of the Lord, but he has to be righteous. We discover that we are not, and yet there is a righteous one who will ascend. And in fact, in Psalm 22, we just saw that there is the death of one who is righteous, the one who can call God Father, and he dies in our place. And then at the end of Psalm 22, he leads a mighty throng, an assembly to praise him. And then Psalm 23, we sing, we are the sheep of his pasture. We are being led by the shepherd, even when we go through the shadow of death. And then Psalm 24, the gates which can only allow the righteous, we demand they open because we are with the righteous Messiah who brings us in. And then Psalm 25, we're in the glory of God. We recognize our problem. We say, don't remember the sins of my youth. Instead, remember your own promises, O Lord. So you see this progression taking place. At the end of book one, Psalm 41, it does warn, however, that the righteous one of God will be betrayed. And that's the quote that Jesus has, Psalm 41, where he says, the one who eats bread with me will betray me. And so book two of the Psalms so, uh, begins with Psalm 42. I know God is good, but I'm depressed. So he preaches to himself, put your hope in God. We saw by the end of book two, Psalm 71, the mature believer has put his hope in God. And now that he's undergoing another trial, another tribulation, he basically says, God, we've been through this. You keep on putting me in these places to train me up, and I know you will remain faithful. So God, deliver me so that I can tell of even this experience to the next generation, to tell them how faithful you are, how wonderful you are. So it's a very confident psalm, and that goes to Psalm 72, the final psalm of book two, declaring that kingdom you promised in Psalm two will be established from sea to sea. The son of David will rule. So why now Psalm 73? Book three of the Psalms are Psalms of exile. It has the two most depressing Psalms, Psalm 77, which ends with the word of hope, and Psalm 88, which has no word of hope. It speaks in Psalm 74 and 79 of the fact that Jerusalem is destroyed. In fact, we don't see animal sacrifices, but we see the Jews having been slaughtered and their blood running through the streets. It is a people who realize we have lost what we had. 
Psalm 73 then is the beginning of the Psalms of exile. And we get the end first. So after he's considered everything, here's what he says. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. As he's considering being in the exile, he says, God's promise didn't fail. Psalm 1 is true. The righteous, the pure in heart obtain all the benefits. So why am I a worshiper of Yahweh in Babylon, having seen my family slaughtered and now I'm a slave? Because God is righteous. Because my fathers sinned against God. He gave us a temple to worship him and told us, I want no images, and yet we brought Egyptian idols and Babylonian idols and our priests started worshiping them. The son of David, Solomon, married pagan wives and built temples for their idols in Jerusalem and led us astray. And kings established themselves and set up cows to worship and said, this is good enough. And people flogged to it. So why are we in the exile? It's because we chose the way of wickedness. And so in the midst of punishment, He's not saying, yay, I'm punished. He is saying, this punishment, if I use it rightly, leads me to see that God actually keeps his word, that God is holy. And that's a good thing because if God is a God who keeps his word, part of his word speaks of redeeming sinners. And while I don't enjoy this punishment, it's absolutely miserable, but it reveals to me that God isn't a fool or a liar, or vain. He doesn't just need worshipers. He wants people who worship him with a united and undivided heart. That's why we worshiped idols and we worshiped him. And he said, doesn't work. I just want you to worship me. I don't care if you bring gold or bulls or sacrifices. Just bring me your heart. And you see the prophets and the psalmists they speak of. You don't desire sacrifices. If I could bring you, you know, the goats and the bulls on 10,000 mountains, it wouldn't do any good. You just want me to actually know you and love you. And isn't that really something we understand from our own lives? So Psalm 73, he declares, God, I know, I, I have to say, God is good to Israel, but I have to admit, I haven't always believed it myself. When I looked around me at the corruption in Jerusalem, when I looked around me and I see the Babylonians who slaughtered the Jews now building all these magnificent palaces and using our gold as sacrifices to their God and decoration to their women, I had to say I, I doubted if God was real or if virtue and purity actually mattered. I was envious. They got their way. I lost. My tribe is slaves. I am beaten down. And they are sleeping in the most comfortable beds after eating the best foods, looking forward to another wonderful day tomorrow. They are fat and sleek. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Pride is in their necklace. They get to do what they want using violence, and they scoff and speak with malice. They strut upon the earth, and they have no fear of you. I live wanting to worship you. I get nothing. They defy you. They obtain everything. And then verse 13. Most of your translations, unfortunately, leave out the word truly, but it's actually there in the Hebrew. He is saying, just as surely as I know God is good to Israel, after meditating upon these things, I also was living my life just as surely believing I'm doing all this, but it's stupid and pointless. And I think this is very important because many believers in all of history, like you and me, we go through it because we don't really want to forsake God, but at the same time, we're not sure if it actually matters because we look around us and we see the wicked do prosper. Righteous people are disrespected. We have family members who are decent, who try to do good, and we have others who laugh at them for it. And we're fine with that because, you know, the guys who are laughing are funnier, more fun, richer. The virtuous often are not as accomplished. They're not able to go as far in business because they won't play the games. And because they speak truth in love, people hate them because they won't flatter. And truly, I thought, 
you know what, this is pointless and vain that I am keeping my heart clean and washing my hands in innocence because all the day long I am actually suffering, being stricken, rebuked by the world. And I kept speaking the truth and everybody laughed at me. I was considered ignorant or I was accused of being self-righteous. That's actually how I feel. And the psalmist is saying this, and this is something to really consider because remember, he's coming off Psalm 72. I know the Messiah will rule. And right now I'm saying, I really don't know if the Messiah has a kingdom. I'm wondering if this is like going to a movie where playing pretend and ignoring reality for a few minutes. Then we get to verse 16. When I needed to strive, when I really wanted to understand this, it seemed to me it was going to be hopeless. I had bet on the wrong horse. I was in the wrong lane. It seemed a wearisome task. And then something happened. I went to the sanctuary of God, and then I discerned their end. Now, when he went to the sanctuary of God, it's not that he saw the marvel and the beauty of you know, everything that was built there. The sanctuary of God, the most important thing is the sacrificial system. So when he goes to the sanctuary of God, what he sees is blood everywhere. Animals being slaughtered. Hearing them either they're blaying or whatever it is, seeing the blood going. And remember, this is the Middle East before refrigeration and electricity. It stinks of death. It is a horrible place to be. As often as they wash it, there's still going to be blood around. It's, I went to the house of the Lord, and what I saw around me was the testimony that all are dying. There is blood everywhere, stench everywhere, and bodies of the sacrificed animals being taken out to be burned or being passed out to the people, whatever it is. And that's when I realized God has set together this entire economy of Israel to testify he hates sin and sinners will die. But he is allowing us to see that one can die in your place. And that is why I had believed. I had not believed in vain. I had believed in a God who makes provision for a sacrifice. And I see in the sacrifice the costliness of sin. You and I get to see this every week as we hear the law and then we're forced to consider, what does it mean that I broke any one of God's laws? Well, let's look at that. That's why we have these passages from Matthew. The soldiers of the governor. Remember, these are the powerful ones that we would envy. Polished armor, regular pay, able to oppress whoever they want. And the governor who gets to live the luxurious life. They take this miserable Jesus into the governor's headquarters they gather together all their friends. They bring the whole battalion, and then they strip Jesus down. They put a scarlet robe on him, and they twist together a crown of thorns, put it on his head. They give him as though a reed as a symbol, but then they take that symbol, the reed, and beat his head with it with the crown of thorns while mocking him, calling him king of the Jews, but showing, I'm just an individual Roman soldier, and yet I get to beat you to my liking. You think you're king? You're talking about redeeming? What a fool you are. They spit on him, struck him on the head, and mocked him, finally took him to crucify him. You might be thinking, it seems vain. It, it, I've, I've been foolish in trying to be righteous because the rest of the world goes on. Nobody cares what I'm saying or doing here on Sunday mornings. Well, remember, we have the example of the cross discern the end of sinners who don't rest in Christ. All that Jesus has undergone is their curse. In fact, it goes all the way to death. On the sixth hour, God, Jesus calls out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And they laughed at him saying, hey, maybe Elijah will come and save him. They're not just speaking curiously. They're actually laughing at Jesus. Oh, because Eli is also the short form of Elijah, but also is the beginning of Elohim. God. So you can understand the misunderstanding there. But finally he dies. So the people who right now look down on Christ's church and mock us and we feel truly like maybe we've made a mistake being here, consider their end. 
understand what it means that sinners are going to die. And yet we are being offered a substitute to die in our place, and that is Jesus. And Jesus is buried and dead. And we are told in John 15, this is because there is no greater love than someone lays down his life for his friend. Jesus is dying as your friend, and he is calling you to acknowledge his friendship by you loving what he loves, righteousness and the honor and praise of God. Romans 5.8, God shows his love for us in that while we were the sinners, while we were the enemies, he sends the Messiah to die for us. First John, this is love. Not that you and I are willing to wake up and come here this morning, but that God sent his son to die the sinner's death, to wash away our sins, to turn away his wrath, and yet for him to remain just because God wants to justify us, but he can't do so by becoming unjust and ignoring sins. So he is justifying us, but remaining just because he takes the penalty for our sins on himself. And this is what the psalmist recognizes even in the exile. Yes, the church can look weak. It can appear that we are foolish. What we are doing is vain, just like a Jew would have felt in Babylon. And yet when we consider, no, 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 this is God's actual word, that if we would not keep his law, he would cast us out of the land. Well, our being in Babylon proves God speaks the truth. What about for you and me? We know Jesus died because the world is different. Never before was there a theology or philosophy that spoke of the worth of the individual. Many speak of the worth of the king or of a particular priest, but everybody else is their slaves. Never before were you told each and every man, woman, and child bears the image of God and is worthy of honor and has a service that brings glory to God. Never before were we told that an unwanted child is not a burden on the family, but one to be cherished. And so the early Christians, part of their great witness was that they took abandoned babies who otherwise would be taken into slavery or prostitution or left to die, and they raised them and said, I don't know you. I don't know your parents, but I know you are human. And that's why the gladiator games ended. That's why there was the development of the idea of a parliament. That's why there was grand churches built. I mean, sorry that too much money was spent on architecture, but there was a desire to respond by glorifying God because we bear his image. And so these are all things that come from this. So we know we have testimony of the real work of Jesus Christ and how in history he transformed men and women who then transformed civilization and that brings us here. But in the meantime, many are called, few are chosen. Wide is the path that leads to destruction. So our numbers don't tell the story, but the reality of the history of Jesus Christ. And so now the psalmist goes back in verse 18, truly, you've actually set these mighty powerful men in slippery places because they are going to fall to ruin. In a moment, they're going to be destroyed and swept away. When you rouse yourself, you will bring them to destruction. So I was a fool. I was embittered. My heart was pricked. I acted like a stupid animal, brutish and ignorant. But now, as I think about the sacrificial system that testifies to your hatred of sin and also your grace to give a substitute, I am continually with you, knowing you are holding my right hand, guiding me with your counsel, finally bringing me to be received into everlasting glory. I don't have anyone in heaven or any hope except for you. There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you being my God and my shepherd. Yes, I'm immortal. My flesh and body will fail. But God is actually my strength, so it doesn't make any difference. In fact, those who are far from you are going to perish. All those kingdoms, all the power that they had, 
none of them have lasted. All the wealth that's been accumulated, right now there's one family that has had wealth for about two or three centuries, and that's a banker from Europe. But every other family that had monarchs and wealth had lost it all. Nobody was able to sustain themselves because it's all foolishness. But as for me, it is good to be near God. But notice, this is not a fool. Verse 28 is combined with verse 14. All day long I've been stricken, rebuked every morning, but it's good. Why? Because even if I'm sitting in Babylon having lost everything, it's because God is just and keeps his word. And part of his word is, and after 70 years, I will restore you. Might not be happy in Babylon, but I'm happy that my God does not lie. And because of that, I can be sure he will bring me to everlasting glory. And that's why you and I now can be with a few believers despised in the world and yet confident of this. Jesus rose from the dead because he gave his word. Any promises, all who come to me, I will never cast away. I will raise you up on the last day. Well, we know our end. So we can say it is good to be near God. I made the Lord Yahweh my refuge that I may tell of all your works. So beloved, Psalm 73, like I said, introduces us to a time of exile. And we can feel that. Yes, we belong to Jesus Christ. Yes, our names are written in the book of life, but we're not home yet. We are still living as sojourners. We are traveling. We are in the wilderness. We are not yet in the land of promise. And therefore, it can feel like we have nothing. It can feel pointless. In Egypt, we had a solid roof above our heads. We had variety of food. We forget we were also slaves and despised. But here, everywhere, we're surrounded by sand, tents that we have to pack up and move, and we eat the same stinking manna every day. But that's the only way to get to the promised land. So Psalm 73 has its problems but it's revealing the problems within us. Also, use it to point you to the solution, the cross. In the cross we see how much God hates sin. And we see the costliness of deliverance for those whom God loves, calls his friend. We also see the end of those who for the moment brag about all their riches and success and power. What Jesus underwent, they're going to undergo. What Jesus' infinite God could do in a moment, for all eternity, they are going to be forsaken by God because they did not want God to be their friend. So, beloved, having now seen the end of the wicked, by looking at the cross, let us believe God's love is very good and it is good to be near God, to have our refuge in God, that we may now be the evangelists who point away from ourselves to our God and to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Let's pray. May your name be glorified, our God and Father, as we wrestle with the reality of our ungratitude, of our jealousy of the world, how we are bitter that we have to forsake sin and do righteousness and love our enemies while others can lash out and attack those whom they hate and satisfy their envy and hate and lust. Lord, we pray that we would be as honest as the psalmist and say, truly I believed I was a fool, so that we would have to ask, are we really? And then consider the cross and realize, no, the cross would be my destiny. My end, I would be forsaken by God if I walked the way of the wicked. But I've been granted a great grace. I've been given life from the dead because you called me your friend and you died in my place. Forgive me, forgive us all for taking this for granted, for despising this and not thanking you every moment of our lives. Instead, may we give glory to you and be thankful for what we have and say, it is good that you loved us and made us your own. 
you are our refuge and our strength. And now strengthen us, embolden us to speak of the excellencies of your grace to all the world. Amen. And so, beloved, let us continue by singing the closing verses of Psalm 73, verses 23 through 28, in sweet communion, Lord, with thee. Let's stand and sing. Please be seated. Well, as I said, we are to look upon the cross, consider the sacrifice of Christ, to know the end of the wicked, but also that we would remember always the way of our deliverance. In the Lord's Supper, we are caused to think about what it meant that the blood of Christ had to be shed, his body had to be broken, he had to die as the sacrifice, the substitute for those whom he would redeem. So the Lord's Supper then is given to you and me to assure us God did provide a sacrifice. We get to now partake of this meal. And remember, you did not get to partake of the burnt offerings, but of the thanksgiving offerings. So while Christ's death was the burnt offering for sin, yet because he died for you, you get to participate in the thanksgiving offering and feed on him and therefore rejoice that God has loved you. And so God wants us to know this work that he has done so that we would be really wise, not worldly wise, but wise in the ways of heaven. So we come to the table of the Lord to obtain the ministry of God by the visible gospel to be assured of the sacrifice of Christ that it is more than sufficient for us and we are the children of God adopted now being fed in the house of the king. We read in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, in their own pride and self-righteousness, will be guilty of profaning the body and the blood of the Lord, holding his sacrifice in contempt. The Lord's Supper is instituted by Jesus Christ. It is to be observed until he comes again, remembering his sacrifice and his death and confessing our present communion with him, though he is in heaven. The physical elements represent his broken body and shed blood, but we receive it as sealing signs given by the Father that his sacrifice on the cross was a benefit to us. In fact, it signifies and seals that our sins are remitted, forgiven, and that we are being spiritually nourished in Jesus Christ, and that Jesus is pledging himself to us. And though we're only going to eat bread and wine with our mouths, by faith worked in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we are actually going to be in union with Jesus Christ. 
The sacrament signs and seals to us the covenant that God declared in his grace, which is the covenant of grace, which says God is faithful. God keeps his word and fulfills his promises and rescues a sinful people and makes them his own holy, precious possession. The supper also summons you and me now to keep our vows to the children that the duties we owe as children of God, consecrating our lives with thankfulness for all that we have received. And so it is necessary to warn anybody who does not take these things seriously or believe the gospel promises are for them or comes in their own self-righteousness, don't eat the body and blood of Christ because you're declaring you don't care about it, but rather you are self-righteous. But though this warning is being issued to you, please remember, if you are broken and humbled, don't keep away from this feeling afraid, but rather understand it is given to the broken and the humble who rest in Christ Jesus alone and believe the promise, the word of God. We, in fact, it's because you base your hope of eternal life on Christ's work in the promise of God that you obtain these blessings. So, in accordance with the warnings that Paul gives, examine yourselves if you believe these things. In accordance with the command of Christ, if you believe these things, Come and receive. Now unto him who loves us and who has released us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and evermore. Amen. Our great God and Father, please give to us, your poor people, the encouragement and the confidence we need. Let us understand and believe indeed you do hate sin. You hate our sin. You despise the sinful thoughts, the blasphemous words, and the evil deeds we've done. And yet, you are receiving us by grace because you also declared that you would provide the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God. Let us therefore approach with bold confidence in your promise, expressing our joy and thankfulness as we receive this gospel seal of your love and the sacrifice of Christ for our sins. Amen. Beloved, lift up your spirits and hearts on high. We lift them up to the Lord. You'll be dismissed to come forward to receive the elements. Return to your seats and we'll partake together. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. But he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I will abide in him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. My own know me, even as the Father knows me and I lay down my life for the sheep. No one has taken up my life from me, but I lay it down of my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from the Father. Coming to Jesus as to a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices which are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The stone which the world rejected has become the chief cornerstone, remaining a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to the world because they are disobedient. But to you, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, you come to proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You were once not a people, now you're God's people. And now you've received mercy. The psalmist had trouble understanding, is it worth remaining faithful to God? Is it worth resting in promises that seem completely lost now that we are in exile? 
And he said, no, I thought about the sacrifices and what it meant. And beloved, that's what the supper does for us. Weekly, we are meant to consider the broken body of Christ because Jesus took the bread, broke it in the side of his disciples so that they would understand and remember the costliness of sin and the end of the wicked. But for them, Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. I died in your place. Do this and confess these truths. Throughout the Old Testament, it was declared that the life is in the blood. And so Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. It takes my life to seal it. Take, drink, remember, and believe the promises of the new covenant. I will be a God to you, to your children, and I will raise you up in the last day. These promises are yours. Let's pray. We thank you, O oh God, because we understand we are completely unworthy of being here. But you sent a substitute to die in our place. He took away the guilt of our sins. We've been granted the righteousness of Jesus Christ in perfect conformity to the law, and you receive us into your house. May we therefore tell of your excellent and wondrous works and glory in your name never being ashamed, but realizing the eternal God loves us. We thank you for the sealing sign which testifies to the reality of the work once accomplished so long ago. We thank you, Lord, that it is a work on our behalf and from which we obtain every good benefit. So we thank you for Christ Jesus. Amen. And so, beloved, as a people who have already sung and declared that it is our calling and therefore we commit to singing the praise of God all the day long and calling upon all to take refuge in him that in prayer through your studies continue to know and ask for opportunity and ability to speak to anyone that God puts in front of you and then also that we may support the mission of the church as again I said this Saturday we'll have opportunity in Torrance, but even today in our offerings that we give, this is in order that we can train up and send missionaries and ministers and make sure the gospel goes forth everywhere. You can give your offerings on the back table as you exit. Let us stand and sing the doxology that is printed for you on page seven, calling upon all creation to bring their praises to our God. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with the revealed will of Jesus Christ our Lord, that together we may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.